Well, the goal is to get them to hear me out there. I can't be that loud. Um, so we got, what, four hours? No, no, no. Just, you guys are not awake at all. <laughs> like, seriously. You guys don't watch anything? Where is it? Authority over. 
over illness. He had authority over he had authority over weather. He had authority over physical things like food. He could take a couple loaves of bread and he can multiply them to feed over five thousand. By the way, how many people did he feed with in the feeding of the five thousand? Anyone have any idea? How many people was it mentioned? Well, that was an easy one. I just told it. You guys can't even pick up those. Come on. I know it's a hard day of classes, but it's evening. <laughs> How many of you have classes tomorrow? What time is your class in the morning? You guys identify the freshman. All right. <laughs> Look, I need, after freshman year, I don't think I ever had a class on Friday. At least not before 10. Okay, 11. The advantage of being a, a engineering student is we had all the adjunct professors, so they all of my classes were at night. But I get to sleep in late. But the uh, the thing is this: when when we look at like the feeding of the five thousand, it was five thousand men that were mentioned. It doesn't mention anything about how many women and children may have been there. Could have been about upwards of 20,000 people there. Okay, and so. When he did that, he took the five loaves, two fish. How do you feed that many people? That would be something that only God could do, to, to be able to take a, a small amount of food and reproduce food. Okay, Things like that. Also, his witness. What did people say about him? The titles they gave him. We call him Jesus who? What did, what did people think his last name is? Christ. Is that his last name? Anyone know what that is? What's Greek? It's a title. Anyone know what it's Greek for? What it means? Huh? Well, it's the same Hebrew. It's the same word that is for the Hebrew word Messiah. Anointed, the anointed one. So the Hebrew word Messiah means anointed one in English. It's the same idea of the Greek word Christ means anointed one. It's a title, like Caesar. Okay? Interesting thing. Think about it. How many of you guys have read through the New Testament? Okay. What's the name that Jesus called himself? What's the title he called himself more than any other? No, it's not Son of God. What? Son of Man. He called himself the Son of Man. You know who called him the Son of God? Demons. Read through the New Testament, you'll see. Not until the end of his ministry does he take the, does he take the name Son of God. Were you sitting back there? I gave up your seat. It's my fault. Was that your seat there? I told her that I would take the blame. I have to hold my word. She looks like she can beat me up. All right. Here's the thing. We look at the, the titles, the, the titles that he's given. Okay? Show his deity. All right? So I want to go through the, some of these things with you. Here's an interesting thing for you to think about. I'm going through just in the first half of the book of Matthew. Okay? Just the first 14 chapters, there are 140 references, about that, 138, references to Christ as deity in those three categories that I just gave you, by what he said, by what he did, and what others say about him. 140 references, and that's only half of the first of the four books of the Gospels. If you read through and you start recognizing the things that Jesus did and said and what people said about him, and you read through the New Testament, you're going to see it's very clear that there's no way to not see that he claimed deity all over the place because of what he says, does, and what people say about him. His words, his works, his witness. They reveal that he must have claimed to be God. Now I'm going to say this. Jesus Christ, there's one thing we know for sure Jesus cannot be. Jesus cannot possibly be a good prophet. Okay, there's no way he can be a good prophet alone. There's no way he can be just a man. He can't even be a good man as Jews believe. Okay? And I'm going to tell you why. As we go through this, I want you to think about how many times we're going to discuss Jesus made it abundantly clear that he claimed to be deity. Now, if someone claims to be God, the creator of the universe, and he's going to let himself be put to death, and his followers are going to follow in that same death. Is that a good person? Is that a good prophet? You can actually talk out loud, it's okay. This is, I'm not your regular teacher. I say, I would like an open air preacher. I'm usually used to people yelling back at me. You can do that. That's okay. My head's still attached. I won't get it off yet. The reality is this. Jesus Christ claimed to be God. That means this. If his claim 
was not true. We wouldn't say he's a good person. We wouldn't say he's a good prophet. We would say he's either a liar, that he knew what he was saying wasn't true, but he wanted either power. Oh, wait, no, he didn't have any of that. He was crucified with no money. So he didn't get money. He didn't get power. He didn't get prestige. Why would he do that? Why would he tell the lie? But if, if he was lying with nothing to gain, that wouldn't be someone we call a good person or a good prophet. We call him a liar. He wouldn't, if he really believed it, I mean, he really thought he was God, like he really thought he was walking on water, then, you know, if he thought he was God but he wasn't, we would call him what? Huh? A lunatic. He's a madman. I mean, that's usually, what do we do with people that think they're God? I have a friend of mine. He actually has, he had a friend who honestly believed through high school that he was God. When he got to college, he thought he was Jesus Christ. And he went to a Bible college. All right, so the reality is there are people who honestly get deluded into thinking they're someone they're not. I did meet someone that honestly believed he was John the Baptist. He really, I think he, I actually believe he really did believe it. Okay? The reality is, I just told him you should be eating honey and locusts like John the Baptist did. So let's see your diet, you know. But the reality is, is that he would either be a liar or a lunatic if he was not God. So he's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. It's the only three categories you can have for him. You cannot have any other. And if he's a liar or a lunatic, then he's also not a good person and he's not a good prophet. You see, the only way you can honestly say Jesus Christ was good is if he was actually God. Because that's what he claimed. Now let me show you why I say that he made that claim. I want to look through, through some... Do you guys all have Bibles? Don't have Bibles? How many of you have a smartphone? Is that why? All right. Then I'll read to you. How's that? Um, we'll just, I want to look at just a couple... A couple of passages. I'm going to look at three to look at what Jesus said to see the explicit statements. How many of you guys have been here for a couple of years? Who, who's here a junior or more? Or let's just do this way. Who, who, here, who was here when I did the debate against Joshua Evans with the, the Muslims? Two? Okay. The, the debate we did was over the, this question of who was Jesus. Okay? Now he wanted to deny explicit statements of Jesus. Here's what he said. He, he said, and this is a very popular thing if you talk to many Muslims, this has very, become very popular, and Joshua had... had you know, had really started this off by getting people to say, Jesus Christ never said, I am God, worship me. I agree with him. I mean, he never said it that way, did he? In that debate, what I did is I said, Mr. Evans will tell you that Jesus Christ never claimed, I am God, worship me. And nowhere in the Quran does it say, I am Muhammad, I'm the prophet after Christ, worship, worship after me. So guy says, yeah, but it implies it. Oh, well, no. can't be true if it doesn't say exactly the way I want it to be said. You see, we're back into the question of what words mean. What does the word gay mean? Does it mean happy? Or does it mean homosexual? Well, it depends when you're speaking, doesn't it? It depends who you're speaking about. It depends on the context. I can use the word gay to mean happy today, can I? Now, that could lead to a misunderstanding if I don't give a full context. If I, if I say Travis is gay, well, we don't want to get that one right. <laughs> right? The con I don't give enough context to that, right? But the, the context, the, when we're speaking, those things are going to, to help us. Well, I'm going to look at the end of John chapter 8. I'm going to read something again. I know if you don't have, I'm going to read a shorter section than I would have, since not everyone has a Bible. But here's, here's what happens. The Jews in, in, are, are arguing with with Jesus, okay? They're having some religious debate. Here's what ends up happening. Just, I'm going to start in verse 57 of John 8. It says, the Jews replied, you are 50 years old. So the argument that he was making was that um, that he, that Abraham was rejoicing in his day. And they were like, dude, you're not even 50 years old. Abraham was several hundred years ago. How could Abraham be rejoicing in your day? Okay? That's the, the argument. The Jews replied, you're not 50 years old, yet you've seen Abraham? 
And Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Look at the next verse. It's a context matters. The next verse is this. And at that, they picked up stones to throw at him. Okay? Why is that important? Well, we're going to turn to John chapter 10, and I'm going to show you why. Now, first of all, the claim, I am, that is a very, very explicit claim. Now, how many of you grew up Jewish? Okay, I'm the only one? All right. So, here's the thing. In a Jewish home, we would never do what you guys probably hear all the time. How many, how many of you go... How many of you have heard people use God's name in vain? Say, God am, or they'll say, oh, OMG. You ever type that in your Texas? Oof. Use God's name in vain. All right, now I get a question for you. How many of you, everyone here love their mom? Everyone love mom? All right. When you go to pay to see a movie, and it's like the number one movie. But what they've done in the movie is they've replaced all the foul, the foul language with your mom's name. They did it purposely. Are you going to pay to see that movie? Who's going to pay to see that movie? Why not? Why won't we go see that movie? Someone. Is this... Because you love your mom. It's disrespectful to mom. Right? So you go pay to see a movie that takes God's name in vain or Christ's, God, Christ's name in vain, one that takes it purposely and pay to support that? Don't answer. All right. <laughs> I said I'm Jewish. I'm good at the guilt trip now. Um, <laughs> I grew up with it. Here's the thing. We, the word God, okay, there's three different Hebrew names for God. Okay, Elohim, uh, Adonai and Yahweh or Jehovah. Why do I say one or the other? Well, in Hebrew, you didn't have back then, you didn't have vowels, they were substituted. Okay? Try this sometime. Take all the vowels out of the words and try reading something. You're going to see you can actually read something without the vowels. You, your mind will substitute the vowels because you know what the words are. Okay? Here's what ends up happening you, we end up with the simple reality that what we end up doing is seeing that in the Old Testament, they had the consonants. When we call Yahweh, we substituted a different name. Okay? I told you the names. One of the names was Adonai. One of the, one of the ways that most Jews will start their prayers, Baruch HaTah Adonai. Even though that word Adonai is Yahweh. That it was such a holy name, they would not say it. That name translated into English is I Am. So when Jesus Christ says to the Jews before Abraham was Ego I me, which is in English, I am, they knew exactly what he was claiming. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, the context. They picked up stones to throw at him. Now, John chapter 10. At the end of John chapter 10, we're going to see if we're going to pick up. Uh, I'll pick up um Oh, I'm going to have to pick up in the middle. I'm going to pick up in verse 29. I know it's the middle of the context. But uh, Jesus is saying this. He says, My Father, who has given them unto me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand. And he says this, The Father and I are one. Now, let me explain some things with that. First off, Jews do not refer to God as their Father. A Jewish prayer group would go like this if it was in English. You would pray by saying, my most holy, almighty God. You put lots of adjectives to it. The almighty creator, Father, God. They don't say Father. That's too intimate. Jesus, when he would claim to be, to say, my Father, that was like, you know, they realized that was like claiming you have a personal relationship way too close. You're not going to a high priest and priests and anyone. You're saying you have direct access? So what do they do? Again, the context. Verse 31, again, the again refers back to the passage I just read to you in chapter 8. Again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. Now, what are they stoning him for? Well, they're going to stone him for blasphemy, but Jesus wants to make sure he's clear. Okay? He'll say, well, this Jesus, you know, he, he didn't really say these things. Well, here's what he said. He said, Jesus replied, I've 
shown you many good works from the Father. Remember I said his words, his works, and his witness here to say, look at the works I do, that proves who I am. I've shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? Now in case you want to know if they understood what he was saying, this is what they say in verse 33. We aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answer, but for blasphemy, because you being a man claim yourself to be God. They understood very clearly what he was claiming. Those are two most explicit passages they could find. He claims to be I am. He claims the Father and I are one. The Jews completely understand it because they pick up stones to stone him, and they're stoning him, and he wants to clarify it. He's stoned, they're stoning him because he claimed to be God. I'm going to give you one more explicit one. This is in uh, Mark chapter 2. Don't have the time to go through the whole context, but let me just give you this. Actually, I won't have time to read it, so I'm just going to explain it. Here's what is happening in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 is the same account that you have in Matthew chapter 9. Now, I remember from Matthew 9 for this reason. I can remember 8, 9, and 10. I'm a simple person. Simple things for a simple mind. Can you remember 8, 9, 10? John 8, John 10, Matthew 9. So I can remember those things. Those are three chapters that have something that is the explicit statements. What ends up happening is here, here Jesus is. He's in the house. The house is filled with people. Okay, You have, you have someone that's, that's uh, has never walked before. They're outside on, on, a, on a stretcher. Okay, The four friends are trying to get him into Jesus so Jesus can heal him. And, they, and they're, they're too crowded. So, of course, the friends do what any good neighbor would do. They climb up the roof and start ripping the roof apart. Isn't that what every good neighbor does? But don't you want your neighbors to come and rip your roof apart? So they can, and we're not talking a small hole. They had to drop down a guy on a bed. I mean, you're probably going to a six by four hole that they ripped up. Okay? And they lower Jesus down. Now, Jesus does not heal the guy. You know what he says? He says, your sins are forgiven. And the Jews are outraged. The Jews are thinking in their mind, who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, let me explain something. Jesus does something. And we can read through the New Testament and skip over this. You know what it says in that text? Jesus answered not their words. He says they answered the thoughts of their mind. Any of you know what I'm thinking? I don't know what you're thinking either. Only God can read what's inside someone's mind. Jesus read their thoughts and answered their unasked questions. Claim of deity number one. But the claim that he said he can forgive sin, they said, well, hey, only God can forgive sin. He says, okay, let me set this out for you. He said, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Now, if you think about it, both are very easy to say, aren't they? One's provable, isn't it? I mean, if I said to any one of you, your sins are forgiven, can you see that? No, we don't get to see sins being forgiven. But if you've never walked before, and your legs are atrophied, and you don't have the muscles... And I say, get up and walk. Or, Can you get up and walk? Well, that's something that's provable, right? If you can't get up and walk, then you know that the other claims I made probably aren't true. But if you get up and walk, you, that's gives credibility. That's exactly what you say. He said, so you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. He turned to the guy and said, rise up and walk. And the guy stood up and took his bed and walked out. So he answers a question that, that was on their mind, not what they said. You can read minds, something only God can do. He had the power to heal someone in a miraculous way, something only God can do. And he had the power, by proving it by what he did with the healing, to forgive sin, something the Jews understood only God can do. You see, we often skip right over those things. Jesus says to, to Nathaniel, you know, I saw you under the tree. We just, we don't just read right over that. Don't you realize that's a claim of deity? How could Jesus, I mean, Nathaniel understood it. He's like, how, how do you know where I, what I was thinking under that tree? How do you know what I was doing? See, those are these claims that are filled throughout the New Testament that we just overlook. The Gospels are filled with claims. It's not like it was edited in afterwards, like some people try to argue. OK? 
okay? That they came up with this theory that Jesus was God after the fact, and they tried to rewrite the Bible to fit it in. Many claim that, all right? Jesus explicitly claimed it. He claimed it in many other ways. Don't have time to go into it. Uh, but he claimed to have omniscience. He claimed to know what people, uh, to what people was in people's minds. He had the works of deity. We already saw the healing. We saw that he said he had the power to forgive sin. He claims to be the judge of the universe. Okay? He claims that he's going to judge people. Um, every time that you see him healing someone, that is a claim of deity. And, and read through it. It doesn't say he, he healed like some people. He healed everybody when he came to town. He healed the entire town. Okay? He had power over, the, over weather. He could walk on water. Ultimately, the ultimate proof, he said, was he would raise himself from the dead. Now, many people think that, you know, they have different religious leaders that claim to be God or that, you know, uh, like the guys, any, any of you, I know, some of you, some of you guys know who Solomon is in New York and the Thou, thou Art God crowd. There's a group of people in New York, my regular hecklers in Union Square, that have started their own religion called Thou Art God. Everyone's God. My argument to them is, after you die, raise yourself from the dead in three days and let's see. Then I'll, you know, do that and I'll believe. Jesus did it, was seen by over 500 people. That's a, a neat trick. How do you fake that one? You don't fake your, you know, a death and then come back to from the dead and be seen by all those people. Things that were, when he, when he born of a virgin, by the way, I, I said earlier that Jesus' title was Son of Man. Anyone know why he claimed to be the Son of Man and not saying Son of God? Okay. So it's, it's a reference to the deity. It's a reference to the Messiah. To show he's human. To show he's do you know why that was important? Here's a simple thing that we don't think about. In case any of you, have anyone ever, ever talked to Jehovah's Witnesses? And they, and they, they focus a lot on that Jesus was a human being. You know, there's a lot of references in the New Testament to Jesus being human. Jesus kept emphasizing that. He emphasized every time he ate and slept and was tired, and he called himself the Son of Man. That's the title. Son of means, if we're going to understand the terms, Son of means have the attributes of. Okay? So if he's son of God, he has the attributes of God. If he's a son of man, he has the attributes of man. You say, well, that's not really how we think of son of. Well, James and John were called the sons of thunder. Did anyone think that two thunderbolts got together and reproduced and produced John and James? I don't think so. Right? We have to understand the language of the time. Here's why Jesus focused, New Testament writers focused on Christ's humanity. In the thinking of the time, there was a, a thought of what's called Gnosticism. Gnostic means knowledge. It's the idea of anything physical is evil, and anything spiritual is good. If Jesus was God, the Gnostics were arguing, for him to be God, he couldn't be physical. Because if he was physical, he would have had to be evil. But So he was just the spirit. The argument at the time of the writing of the New Testament was that Jesus was only God and he wasn't human at all. He looked like a man. That's why so much of the New Testament argues for his humanity. If you don't believe that Christ came in the flesh, it says you don't know Christ. You don't have life. Why is it important to believe Christ came in the flesh? Because the people he's writing to, that John was writing to, did not believe that Jesus came in the flesh. That's why he called himself the Son of Man, because no one questioned his deity at the time. They questioned his humanity. Now we change that. Interesting thing. When he claimed to be, when the claims were that he was born of a virgin, okay? And I'm going to explain why is, it, why is it important for Jesus to be born of a virgin? You guys ever think about that? Maybe, huh? It's a miracle. It's a miracle. So there's more important reasons. Huh? He's sinless. And that's a very important thing. Here's the interesting thing about Judaism. Judaism is the only religion where the religion is passed on through the mother. Okay? There's a reason. That way Jesus could be a Jew. He didn't have a human father because I got bad news for all the guys here in the room. If you ever get married and your wife yells at you for the way the kids behave, it is your fault. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, sin is passed on from the father 
to the child. That's why Jesus couldn't have a human father. If he had a human father, the sin nature would have been passed on to him. If he didn't have a human father, he didn't have a sin nature. How does the lineage start with David, though? Well, it starts at Adam. For uh, Jesus' lineage. There's two lineages, one of, of Mary and one of Joseph. One goes back to David because of a prophetic prophecy that, that, that David would have a, a, someone that would come after him there would be an eternal king, the Messiah. And this was the long-awaited one. So because of the because they're they're bringing it in, in that lineage, they're trying to focus on his kingship. It starts with David. Okay? The other one that's trying to show he's got the bloodline goes goes through all the way back to Adam. Does that help? Okay, so here's the thing. The, the reason that's important to know that Jesus was born of a virgin is this. Okay? And I hope that I've given you enough evidence that Jesus that claims that Christ was God through his words, through his works, and through the witness. Okay, the fact that he was worshipped is another. The fact that, I mean, look at the way demons respond to him. Okay? But here's the thing. Why? Why must Jesus be God? Jesus had to be fully God and fully man. And let me explain to you why. Okay? Here's the thing. We talked about the sin nature. Every one of us has a sin nature. Okay? And yes, we can blame our fathers. Okay? Guys, sorry. I tell people all the time, they look at my kids, and if you looked at my kids, you'd be like, oh, they're such good-looking kids. And I'm being very honest when I say they get their good looks from mom, because, you know, you know, I can't do this. They get their good looks from mom and their sin nature from dad. I'm being honest. I'm not just trying to stay out of the doghouse, though it helps. Um, <laughs> but the reality is this. We have a sin nature. Okay? We violate God's law. We break His law. Okay? Here's what it says. Uh, in Revelation 21.8, it lists a whole bunch of different sins, like sorcery, which, by the way, is drug use. Okay? Um, but... Uh, idolatry, different things. But then at the end of the whole of this long list, it says, and all liars will have their place in the lake of fire, burns and burns, which is called the second death. Now, how many of you here would honestly say you've never told a lie? Yeah. Anyone that raised their hand, you would have been telling one right now, wouldn't you? <laughs> had a guy once, I, 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 we were in the mall, and, and uh, I asked him, I said, have you ever told a lie? And he said, no. And I just looked over at his wife, and I said, and she just, boom. <laughs> she told me that she lied, he lied to her this morning. Okay, well, is that what, you know, come on. Someone says they never lied, just ask their, their, you know, friends. You know, we'll find that out real quick. So if all liars have them a place in an eternal lake of fire for one lie, now, some of you go, well, Dude, that seems a little bit extreme. Anyone thinking that? Honestly, come on. I'm thinking that. All right, let me see if I can make that seem more rational to you. Okay? Um, if AJ here, I'm going to pick on AJ. Because we're probably so many people that can say the press. So AJ comes and he threatens my life. Because we're good friends. <laughs> okay. So he threatens my life. I said he looks funny. And so he threatens my life. Now, what are the police going to do? They're probably just going to tell AJ to stay away from me, right? Now, AJ decides the same, to tell the same threat to the President Barack Obama. What do the police do with AJ? They, they arrest him? They throw him in jail? They probably forget where the key is? Right? What made the difference? I mean, AJ threatened me and he threatened the President. It was the same threat. What made the difference? The authority, how important he is. Barack Obama is way more important than me, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, why are you laughing? Okay, this joke may actually work as well as... Yeah, I used to say this, but it doesn't work well when there's people who don't like President Barack Obama. He calls himself the Messiah, so I said, you know, Barack Ob God is actually more important than Barack Obama, though Barack Obama doesn't know it. <laughs> um, problem with having thinking you're God, you know? Um, and I'm not getting political. It's just... When, 
what made the difference. It was who was threatened, right? So it doesn't matter that I lie, it matters who I lie to or about. The fact that I'm breaking God's law, God judges every one of us in word, in thought, in deed. Jesus Christ said that we will be judged for every idle word we said. And we live in America, we've created a whole industry of idle words. Entertainment Today, People Magazine. We have a whole industry set up for gossip, don't we? <laughs> right? A lot of idle words. We're going to be judged for every one of them. God's going to judge our heart. He says if we've ever looked with lust, we've committed adultery of the heart. If we've ever been angry with someone, we've committed murder of the heart. That's how high the standard is. We have to be absolutely perfect. We break any one of them. Now, if you really, if you, if you think, well, I still think I'm a pretty good person. Let me ask you this. The first and greatest commandment is this. To love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Okay? The average person makes between ten and 20,000 decisions a day. I mean, putting your shoes on. Maybe some of you have a choice of shoes to put on. You know, maybe you're like my son. who has like four different pairs, and has, he's got to figure out what his clothes he's wearing to know which shoes he I got one pair of shoes. They work for everything. There's no thinking about. But do you think about, like, do you actually honestly put God first in every decision? Now, how many decisions can you honestly say you put God first and foremost? Maybe a hundred? Okay, you're a really good person. A thousand. Okay, so that means let's be really nice and say you only make 10,000 decisions a day. That means that 9,000 times a day, you break the first and greatest commandment times 365 days a year, times however old you are, and you still think you're good enough to go to heaven? Yeah. I got a long rap sheet. I'm like twice as old as some of you guys. <laughs> right? So the reality is, we're not as good as we think. We just justify it so we think we're better. Here's the thing. Here's why Jesus had to be God. Okay? I'm going to bring all of this together to this point. If I go to a courtroom, and I have a fine that I owe. I owe a fine, maybe it's you know, $10,000. Right? I don't have the money. Right? Now, Travis can give me the money because he's a nice guy. He writes me a check, he's got tons of money sitting in the bank somewhere. And so, <laughs> someone's going to come talk to you later. <laughs> so the reality is, someone can, some other person can pay that, can't they? They can pay that fine. I can, I can even have someone else can do jail time. You know what? I can't bring my poodle in to do jail time for me. But here's the thing. Another human can. So here's, that's why he had to be a human. Let me explain why he had to be God. Okay? This is why Jesus Christ had to be God. We owe an eternal fine. If I lived a perfect life, I never broke God's commandments ever, I can make you pay for one of you, the sins for one of you guys. Now, how long would it take you to pay for your sin? How long? Forever. And sorry, I paid for my wife first. You guys all this. <laughs> right? I, but how many people can I pay for? One. Okay? I can pay for one. Here's the thing. An eternal being can pay an eternal fine and accounts for all of eternity. That's why Jesus Christ had to be God. To pay an eternal fine, you have to have an eternal being. But to pay a fine for you and I, you have to be man. You see how the scriptures bring everything together in a way that is very logical, very reasonable, that Jesus Christ, the claims of him through Christ, that is how we have forgiveness of sin. If Jesus Christ is not God, then we, according to Paul, are men most pitied. Because we have no forgiveness of sin. We can live in our life thinking we're forgiven. And we are going to spend eternity in a lake of fire. We only have that forgiveness because Jesus Christ, God Almighty, died in our place as a man. He can die. He died in our place so we can have everlasting life. Do we deserve it? Uh -huh. Absolutely not. But isn't it good news to know that God did that? That God Almighty, think about it. Ask yourself whether you would do that. Some of you have heard me last year, and I used the same illustration, but I use it all the time because it's so, it's, I guess, to me, it's powerful, but think about it. When you leave heaven, if all the angels are, you're sitting in heaven, you're God, you're Jesus. All the angels are singing your praises. There's no sin, there's no sickness, there's no suffering, there's no starvation. Would you leave that place to come here? I mean, just think about that. 
And you come for one purpose. So you could be put on a cross by your very creation. You could be beaten, mocked, spit upon, so that you can die. Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus Christ came as a man, as a slave, even unto death. <coughs> he came for one purpose, to die for you and I. Now, you get stressed out of school? Think about what Christ went through. Maybe some of you have physical ailments. Think about what Christ went through. You know, any physical ailments we have, well, how long are we going to live with them? 70, 80 years? 90 if we're really healthy? And then eternity. And there will be no physical ailments after that. And we live with some physical ailments or some stress for a short time. You know what those physical ailments end up doing? Giving us a longing for the next life. Giving us a longing for heaven. It should have been. Right? So Jesus Christ very clearly, through his words, through his works, and through the witness, claimed to be God Almighty. And he had to be God for him. Does that make sense? All right. So now, do you want to Q&A? Yeah. Or? At this time, we're just going to move into a time of Q&A again. Uh, everything's on the table. If there was anything that wasn't addressed that you want further addressed, anything related to the subject, if you do have to go, don't feel pressured to stay. I know some of y'all yeah. felt awkward to so get up in the middle or anything yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, pretty much questions about anything.
know, they were videotaping. I really want the video tape going this way because it was kind of funny to see the world. this way to 
the, to your question. What's the hardest question I get? The reality is, is most people don't ask questions, they make claims. I never, as a general policy, answer someone's claim. If you made a claim, the burden of proof is on you to support it, not me. I had a guy that I'm debating on Facebook. Um, actually, if you guys, uh, I, I think I broke my card. I should have my card here. Uh, but if you go to strivingforeternity.org, um, or you go to the YouTube channel Striving for Eternity, uh, actually, you can just look up Refuting Islam in three minutes, and it's the top one. Um, it's our latest video. You can read the comments there, and you'll see a Muslim. I've been going back and forth. We got like 90 comments. Just he and I. I don't know how many other comments from other people, but he and I going back and forth. His argument is that the Bible was written in one language that's now dead. We don't have that language. This isn't really the Bible. The Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek. No, it wasn't. Can you support that claim? Everyone knows it. That's not support. That's not evidence. You said the Bible was written in one language. Then the argument is, one of the things he's actually arguing in that is he, he made the statement that I was wrong when I said that the Quran teaches that Christians believe the Trinity is the Father, the Mother, and the Son. Does that sound accurate? Does that sound like I said someone? I should have said because the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that we Christians worship Mary as God. Now he told me I'm wrong because that's not what the Quran teaches. And then a couple comments later, about 35 comments later, he ended up telling me that we Christians worship Mary and she's part of the Godhead. Thank you for proving my point. But the reality is that, and you can read through that, and you can sit there and go, dude, don't you see? You're arguing that Christians, the whole argument is that you say Christians worship Mary, and we're saying we don't. That's all proof that the Quran can't be from God. But the argument is that when we look at this, it's like, you're saying we don't do this, and then you do that very thing. And when you point out he does that very thing, he denies it. That's the simple reality. What you're dealing with is we do live in a culture that doesn't do critical thinking. They, people don't know how to think critically. People don't know how to question what their own belief systems. They have statements. Um, for those who, who are used to, you know, I know a couple of sisters here who have been in Union Square with me. Um, we have a regular heckler, Jason. Jason one time was screaming at the top of his lungs, there, there is no God because there's evil in the world. Okay? And he's just screaming it over and over. So I, I was like, everyone quiet down, everyone quiet down. I said, tell me, how could there be evil in the world without God? Now what did I do? He made a statement that he thinks, I know, what most Christians do when they're out there in New Square is they try to give an explanation for evil. Now, I can answer where evil came from. That's not the problem. The problem is that he made a statement he can't support. I mean, where did he have evil if there was no God? So I asked him that. He says, Will you tell me what evil is? I said, Dude, I didn't claim that there's evil in the world. You did. Tell me where, you, where evil came from. You define it. Tell me how we can have evil without God. He said, No, you tell me. I said, Okay. Evil is the absence of good. Good is defined by God. So how can you have evil without God? His reaction? <laughs> and, <you're laughs> God. and the crowd did exactly what you did. A whole crowd of people, we had like 100 people that all laughed at him as he walked off. He didn't have an answer. He's just never had the answer. Okay? So I'm saying that to say this. You guys get challenged with things. People give you a thing that they think you're afraid of talking to someone sharing the, the gospel because they may ask you a hard question. They're not going to ask you anything hard. You know why? They don't have the answer either. But as long as they put the pressure on you and then you're in the spotlight, they feel like they're off the hook and they actually think they're smart because they're not having to defend any of the idiot thing, dumb things they're saying. You know? And we say dumb things too, okay? Let's not pretend like it's only, you know, we have to be honest about how stupid we are. Okay, not you or these men. All right. <laughs> any other questions? I think it might be a nine. Five. It's, I know it's five. five. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the exact. I think it's five. Um, 50 something? Nah, I think it's like. 50 something. Uh, I'm going to get back here. Okay. Actually, um, oh man. I was going to look it up because I'm trying to see if I have it on my phone, but I just looked and I have like four, four voice messages. You know, sometimes I really like technology and other times. <laughs> Alright, I'll, I'll look it up. It 
it's, it's, um, it's definitely fun. Oh, yeah. Um, but I want to get like in the 20s or 30s. Um, I'll get it that big. Because uh, I just, I, and I just worked with them. Just, I know where they are home. Yeah. That helps you. <laughs> My testimony is, is uh, really boring. on my own 
without ever hearing anyone else speak. And I still have one that's still unique with me. I had the disciples digging a hole underneath it. You know? Chuck goes, dude, in three days? <laughs> and so when I could not have a response to the, the resurrection, that, that was the point that I knew uh, that Christ had to have been God. That he did die as a payment for my sin. And the very first night ever hearing the gospel on Saturday, uh, July 21st, 1984, on the steps of the Dairy Queen in Chinatown, in San Diego, uh, I repented of my sins. 